The Bible is filled with narratives that humanity can emulate and relate to. The sacred text is filled with life from every angle possible. No matter what is going on in our lives, the Bible has some answers to the issues we are dealing with. If we are dealing with depression, the Bible helps. If we are dealing with defeat, the Bible has a victory to encourage us. The Bible can help us with those issues if we are dealing with something in our relationships. The Bible has a way of navigating us through our own lives to help us deal with the tensions that affect all of us. If the enemy confronts us, the Bible teaches us that a table will be prepared right before them. The Bible helps us to understand that when enemies have come up against us and they have set traps to trap us up and to trip us up, the Bible says that no weapon formed against us will prosper. One of the challenges we face with is destructing what the Bible has taught us that will empower our lives. Shallow beliefs that marginalized people need deconstructions. Whitewashed, watered-down theology mishaps must be deconstructed. The thinking that God is only concerned about those who are on the top of life needs to be deconstructed. Deconstructing is a problem because everybody wants to be deep or afraid to admit they, they hate, that they have been wrong all this time. See, just because you've been doing something for a long time doesn't mean you've been doing it the right way all the way all the time. Grace and mercy feels in the areas of our lives that God knows that we have been taught wrong. But when revelation comes, we are responsible for what we do with the revelation of God. The disciples learned something in this text that will help us today. There is a different outcome for listening to Jesus' instructions about doing what we've always done. The disciples, my brothers and sisters, if you remember, are professional fishers. They know how to fish. They know how to mend their nets. And when Jesus comes upon them, he sees them washing their nets. They know how to catch fish. One thing about them, they know, how, they know something about fish. They, they know how to clean fish. They even know how to eat fish too. But with all the experience under their belts, the text says that they had toiled all night and caught nothing. Have you ever been doing what you've always done and still haven't caught anything? How do you feel about doing all day what you've always done day in and day out and you still have caught nothing? I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but I know somebody knows exactly what I'm talking about. Somebody knows what this feels like somebody is in this place right now. You have been doing the same old thing and you ain't caught nothing. Somebody today is feeling this and have been feeling like this for a very long time. You and these disciples are in the same place. These disciples do something daring that you and I are afraid to do. They even give Jesus a slight rebuttal. God, has God ever told you something again that you had just done wrong and you caught nothing? Allow me to contemporize this exchange of vernacular between Jesus and the disciples. Don't allow me some homiletical imagination and let's, let's go to the text. Uh, and they say, uh, Jesus, check this out. Um, we know something about fishing. We know how to catch some red snappers, some trout, some orange ruffies, some tilapia, and we know how to catch us some catfish and some perch and some, uh, 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 what you call that other one. Uh, we know how to catch us some whiting. We, we know something about fishing. Jesus, don't you know we are professional fishers? We have been doing this for so many years of our lives that we just don't understand why we've been out here all night long, Jesus, and we have not caught anything. Jesus, don't you understand that not only have we been out here all night and haven't caught anything, we're also tired. See, 
You can be doing the same thing for so long and not even think about the fact that you're really tired of doing the same thing. Jesus, when you, when you are tired of doing the same thing and it doesn't work, you don't have any more expectations anymore. Here is the shift that's pregnant with hope and possibility. Jesus says, I hear what you're saying. I understand your situation. But I want you to know, I got some instructions for you. But I like what brother Peter, because Peter, at this point, he's Simon. He hasn't been changed to Peter. He's in his old nature. His new nature hasn't spoke up yet, because that's just a few moments away. But, but he's understanding that I hear what you say, Jesus. I got a rebuttal about what you say. However, nevertheless, I'm going to do exactly what you told me to do. Is there anybody here that has a nevertheless available? That after all you've done, that after all of your experience, after everything that you have uh, uh, encountered in your life, you've gotten to the point that you have no more options, do you still have a nevertheless available? We know what it's like to have some burdens in life, but sometimes you feel like you can't go on any further, but yet God tells you to do something, and I want to question somebody today, even if it's not uh, anyone in here, I want to question anybody on the virtual, do you still have a nevertheless to God's command? Is there anybody that has what I call a mustard side seed of nevertheless? I want to encourage you today, my brothers and sisters, that no matter where you are right now, no matter where you are on this journey in life, God is looking for your nevertheless. God is looking for you to exercise that nevertheless that you have. God is betting on you, my brothers and sisters, to utilize that nevertheless that you still got deep down in your soul. God knows what he has planned for you. And he knows that if you act in obedience with your nevertheless, you are going to be blessed more than you've ever been blessed before. Here is, here is the blessing. God is not bothered by your doubts, your suspicions, your concerns, or your disbeliefs. God can handle all that, my brothers and sisters. God is more significant in all of what you're dealing with. What God wants from us is to give him another chance to trust him with what the Lord has instructed us to do. See, see, God intends to bless us. Yes, he does. God intends to prosper us. Oh, and definitely God intends to empower us. Let me say this, that prosperity is not relegated to just creature comforts, but peace is better than anything we can buy or even purchase. That's prosperity. Having a sound mind and a healthy body cannot be bought. That is prosperity. Knowing that our safe, our soul is safe and secure and Jesus is priceless, that is the best prosperity that we could ever get in this life. I wish I had somebody here with me today. But this text is tailored to teach us that launching and looking deeper will help us catch bigger in life for God's purposes for our lives. See, Shallow water is where you can catch nothing. See, shallow water is not deep enough for net fishing. It's barely deep enough for pole fishing. I know a little bit about fishing. Never forget it. His name was Mr. Payne. We used to go fishing on the banks of the Detroit River right below the Uniroyal Tire Company at that time. And Mr. Banks used to teach us about how to understand the undercurrent that was going on in the river. See, rivers have undercurrents that, that you will never see because when the current is really high under, it looks real smooth on the top. But when the, water, when the water is rough on the top, it's not necessarily rough on the bottom. And he would help us to understand that you got to learn how to launch out deep enough so that you can go where the fish are. We just had our little poles. We were young fellas hanging out with Mr. Payne. I don't know about you, but I learned how to hook. Uh, uh, I, know how to, I know how to hook a worm and a minnow. I know how to cast them out. Well, I used to, rather. 
haven't been fishing in about 40 something plus years. But the Lord have mercy. I remember my memory is still good. My memory is still good. And, and Mr. Payne had what was called a real fishing wire. We had one of them Zepcos or zebras or whatever it was called. And it only had enough, it only had enough wire or enough fishing line to only catch a three pound fish. But he said, if you're going to catch the big fish, you're going to have to have a rod and the line is going to have to be able to handle a 20 pound fish because a 10 pound fish has enough tug on it that it make you feel like you're pulling in a whole tire, if you will. And every now and then, we would catch a little something. But then sometimes we would cast out and wouldn't go far enough and our line got hooked on debris. And we had a whole bunch of seaweed when we pulled it in. And Mr. Payne says, sometimes you got to launch out further and deeper because you're looking too shallow. I'm trying to help somebody. Shallow mindsets are not deep enough. Shallow water is not where the real fish are. Shallow people are those who refuse to let go of the familiar. Shallow people refuse to change. They refuse to upgrade. They refuse to adjust. And God knows they refuse to move. Shallow people are like big fish in small ponds. They can't see nothing else except for themselves. But what God wants us to do is launch and look deeper because God has something for us that we've never seen before. See, my brothers and sisters, looking deeper is a decision. Launching deeper is an inside job. You got to understand that on the inside of you, God wants you to launch deeper than what you've been doing. Looking deeper is a mindset. you got to think deeper, right? Launching deeper is a posture. You and I have been Christians long enough to no longer desire shallow water blessings when God has deep water blessings available for all of us. Looking deeper is learning to see life from a different perspective. Launching deeper deepens our commitment to the Lord. Why? Because the church... Let me say this, it's designed to grow and flourish. Ah, this is going to get quiet right up in here, but it's a good time to listen. The church is designed to grow and flourish. The church is not a fishbowl that limits the number of people because each fish needs a certain amount of oxygen to survive. But they can't grow any prominent than the environment that they're in. I was fortunate enough to have a father who loved fish. Not only did he like the fish, but he liked fish at the house. And so we always had an aquarium. First, we started out with a 10-gallon, and then we went up to a 15-gallon, and eventually we got to a 50-gallon tank. And Daddy said that you can only allow so many fish in the tank because too many fish in a crowded tank would cause other fish to suffocate because they don't have enough room or oxygen to breathe. That would help us to understand that the water every now and then will get murky and you need to change the filter and then take the fish out of the tank, set them in something else so you can clean the bowl and the algae and everything else that was affecting the health and life longevity of the fish. My father was a very smart man and he understood that the water had a certain pH balance that needed to be maintained in order for the fish not to catch any disease. I'm going to help somebody. My father understood that if you did not clean the tank, if you did not change the water and remove the old filter and put a new filter in, you were subject to contaminate the fish after you, after you put them back into the bowl and you would cause the fish to either catch some algae diseases or some funguses or they will eventually die. The church is a numberless ocean big enough to handle all our personalities, differences, and diversities. The church is not a pond filled with special hand-picked people who are hand-fed the delicacies of a chosen diet. Could it be that the problem with many of our churches is that no one wants to accept the responsibility of changing the water? 
Could it be that we have been doing the same thing for so long that no one has paid attention that we need to change the filter? Could it be that we have been so stuck in what we've been doing, not knowing we have not caught anything, that the church could be suffocating from toxic environments? Because the algae of people's mentalities and spirits have caused for the tank to be contaminated. Could it be that the reason why many of our people are not growing the way they have needed to be growing is because they come to a place that is no longer accepting of things being changed so they keep the murky water and they keep doing the same thing that they always done. Could it be that the church is guilty of only fishing with a pole when Jesus has designed the church to fish with a net? Ah, my brothers and sisters, it's frustrating doing the same old thing, expecting different results. It's frustrating relying on what you've done in the past to keep progressing you in your presence. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is open to all humanity including all ethnicities, cultures, and all forms of celebrations. What can we learn from these disciples to move us from frustration to a nevertheless mentality for a bigger catch? I want to drop these three things on you, and I promise you I'll get it out of your way. First of all, we move from frustration to nevertheless when we understand that God knows better than we do. <laughs> I wish I had somebody here. Not what we think. Not what we thought we knew, but God knows a whole lot more than what we'll ever know. We must trust that God has the last say-so in everything that we do, and we know that we serve a God who does not want us to fail. That's a mindset 